Okay, so thank you all so much for coming. Um, I really appreciate everybody being here. Um, I know um, you could do a million things that you choose to even, but you chose to be here and I really, really appreciate that. Um, and thanks to everybody who was very kind about my video, my ISL video. I was very nervous about putting it up and everyone was very kind about it. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, it's not easy learning a new language and it's definitely not easy putting content out in it. Um, particularly at this early stage, um, but I really, really appreciate it. And of course, all credit goes to Catherine here, who was very helpful <laughs> putting that video together. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen with some slides um, and I'm just going to get started. Um, if I can still see. Um, okay. Can everyone see my slides? I'm going to spotlight Catherine as well. You should be able to see Catherine. I really hope you can because I can see a different thing than everyone else can see. Someone just let me know in the chat. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Leah. Thank you very much. Great, wonderful. Um, okay, so I'll get cracking. So, so as you can see, this presentation is about deaf people in the criminal justice system. And my name is Dr. Gerodine McAvoy. Gerodine is fine, or my sign name. Catherine is signing it there. Um, uh, for now, this is what it is. <laughs> um, so thank you all for being here. Um, so yeah. So first things first, I find when I kind of enter into deaf spaces, particularly in Ireland, the first question people ask me is, who are you? What are you doing here? I haven't seen you before. I don't know you. So I'm going to tell you. <laughs> My name is Garolyn McAvoy. Hello. Thank you all so much for being here and for, for helping me with this research, which I'll get into. Um, I'm hearing, um, I'm from a hearing family and I'm an Irish speaker, um, but crucially, I'm not from an Irish speaking family. So I didn't grow up speaking Irish. I came to it much later in my life. Um, and it's a community that I sort of found as a teenager and as an older teenager and found my place in that community. So you can probably tell I was very sort of found a, a similarity there with some parts of the deaf community and some of the stories that deaf people have told me. I, I kind of thought, hey, that's a little bit like my story that this community that I kind of didn't know anything about and didn't grow up in, I now found later in life. Um, I'm not saying that the two communities are the same, but I did find a similarity there that I was very interested in. I'm from Leash, Leash Abu. <laughs> Um, and I did a PhD in Dublin in between 2016 and 2021. And so I spent five years doing a PhD. Um, during my PhD, I did QQI level three at the IDS, at the Irish Deaf Society, ISL. And that was really great. And I'm now taking QQI level four. Um, and I'm taking it on Zoom and I really, really enjoy it. It's a really, um, really good good class I'm enjoying it a lot but my ISL for any of you who saw the video it's not great yet <laughs> um, okay so a little bit about the research then why everyone is here this evening so I did this research on a community that I'm not part of I did it on two communities but one of the communities I'm not part of and that's the deaf community right um, so I really wanted to make sure that I wasn't just coming into this community doing research and then leaving and never to be seen again and that the I take the research with me I wanted to make sure that the research that I did looking at deaf people with deaf people and about deaf people that I bring it back to deaf people and that's what I'm doing here now so I finished my PhD last year and I kind of wrapped everything up <laughs> nicely and I wanted to make sure that I still brought it back to deaf people and to the deaf community who were so welcoming in the first instance. Um, and so that's why I'm here this evening talking to you. Um, so I did the research at Dublin City University at the School of Law and Government. Um, I have a language background. I have a background in law and language, um, but uh, it was the School of Law and Government. So the focus was law rather than language. And the focus then was the right to a fair trial for minority language users. And as I said, and as I get into, I did two groups. So I did deaf people who use ISL 
and Irish speakers. And I looked at both of these groups in Ireland and I looked at similarities and I looked at differences. And most importantly, I did interviews. So I met with groups of people and I asked them about their experiences. And then I looked at that research. So what people had experienced. Um, and I'm very glad to have done that. It was very eye opening. And kind of most of what I'm going to talk to you about this evening is those experiences. So the interviews then. So as I said, I, I did two groups. I did Irish speakers and deaf people. For the focus of this evening, I'm going to talk to you about just the deaf people. Um, my PhD was very long. <laughs> so I think somewhere around 120,000 words. So it's quite long. And it's very difficult to summarize it into a short space. And it's very difficult to summarize it into 30 minutes. So I'm kind of cherry picking here. Um, but for the purpose of this, because I'm bringing it back to the deaf community, there will be that focus on, on deaf people and what I found out about the deaf community. Um, there's, it's, it's available on the internet for anyone who's interested in reading it. It's very long, but um, it's there for you to read if you are interested in more. But for today, I'm just going to focus on, on the, the deaf community. So the groups that I interviewed then, the deaf people or the deaf group, shall we say, that I interviewed um, consisted of, of different people. So I had two experts, and these are like academic experts in deaf studies or deaf issues. I had two lawyers who had worked with deaf people previously. I had one member of Angarda Siakona, one member of the police and five deaf people who had experienced or had had an experience with the guards or the courts or the criminal justice system in some way. Um, and this was the, the group of people in the, shall I say, deaf group. There was also people in an Irish speaking group. But as I said, for tonight, we're just going to talk about the, the deaf group. So again, more about that group. So I had four interviews with ISL interpretation and they were broken up across the different people. So some of the experts and uh, some of the deaf uh, people who had experiences with the guards, um, they used ISL. I had six of those interviews were in spoken English. All of the deaf people that I spoke to were identified as deaf with big D or small D. So they all saw themselves as deaf. They all saw themselves as part of the community. Um, all of the deaf people were ISL users. Everybody was an ISL user. Um, people had different, varied, preferred methods of communication. Um, as I said, some of the deaf people used spoken English for the interview, and it was up to them what they wanted to do. Um, sometimes people wanted to do it in English. Sometimes people wanted to do it with an ISL interpreter, and I honoured that in all instances. And I had two hearing people who were also ISL users um, who I interviewed. So that was the breakdown. So it was quite a different group. Um, some interviews had interpreters, some didn't, some were recorded, some were not. Um, and the data then came out of that. So in terms then of experiences, so I had a lot of people talk to me about a lot of different things. When we talk about like experiences with, with the guards, Sometimes it was like you're driving along and it was a road checkpoint, you know, when they're checking for um, like tax or insurance or maybe even breathalyzing. Um, it was kind of those instances. So a person was just driving and they, they met a checkpoint. And so they interacted with the guard that way. Sometimes it was like traffic experience or traffic infringements, like, uh, say, speeding or maybe making an improper term or uh running a stoplight or something um something like that um some people were also victims of crime right so some people were had a crime done to them um and they interact with the guards or the courts in that way what's important to remember is that some people fell into both groups so fell into all the groups um, these weren't these are not all of the instances. There were many other instances, but this is just kind of the main example. But sometimes people can be a victim of crime, but also be guilty of a crime or a suspect of a crime. So 
maybe I my house was burgled, but also I had one time gotten penalty points, you know, so people can be both um, in this instance. So it's not just one or the other. Um, the interactions were mostly with the guards. So mostly people I, I spoke to had interactions with the guards, but there were some people who dealt with the courts. There were some interactions with the courts. Um, but for the most part, like any, like any reality in the criminal justice system, it's mostly with the police. That's where most people deal. And then very few people go on to courts, but some do. Um, so that's mostly where it goes. Okay, so now we're getting to the good stuff, the findings. What did people experience? So I've broken down the experiences into sort of two main outcomes. Um, and one outcome was people were not believed that they were deaf, right? So they were immediately perceived as lying about being deaf. Or on the other side, people were pitied for being deaf. So people were sort of seen as this like, oh, you poor creature, you're deaf, you poor thing. And there were those two experiences. And I think that those are really interesting experiences because they tell us a lot about how deaf people can experience, you know, dealing with the guards and dealing with the courts. And it can sort of tell us a lot about access and a lot about dignity and how that can be affected. Um, and can affect people in the, the criminal justice system and particularly deaf people. So I'm going to give you some examples here from the data. So there is a quite a, a large chunk of text of words coming at you. Um, and I will read them out and kind of give a second and Catherine can interpret. Um, but it, I think it is important that you're aware of what people told me in their interviews. OK. So the first instance is when people were not believed about being deaf. OK, so the guard or the court, whatever it was, immediately thought they were lying and said, oh, you must not be deaf. You must be lying. You must be causing trouble. And they reacted then to that. So this is the first instance. So this person said, the guard took me and put my arms behind my back. And I was saying, I'm deaf, I'm deaf. And he took me. He had me like this with my arms squeezed behind my back and was going to bring me to the station, the Garda station. And then he pushed my head up against a fence as well. And I wasn't saying anything. And he started doing this to me. So he was tapping him on the chin lightly. Um, patronizing. He was saying, come on, talk. And I was saying, I'm deaf. I'm deaf. I can't talk. And so this for context, this was a person who had, I believe it was some sort of misunderstanding. So there had been a misunderstanding with another person um, and a Garda kind of came upon the scene, a Garda arrived. And because this person was deaf and communicating using ISL, their preferred method of communication, the Garda sort of saw that aggressively and immediately grabbed this person and detain them and physically restrained them in a way that they couldn't communicate properly. And so this was really, really something that, that stuck out for me because I'm hearing, I communicate through spoken language. Gardaí don't gag me, they don't put something over my mouth if I was to be arrested, that's not something we do. But to detain a person who communicates using their, their body is to cut off a method of their communication. And it very much felt that way for this person. And they were very much affected by this, this interaction. And it was really upsetting to them thereafter. And they were really affected by it. Um, and I suppose I would say rightly so, um, because it was so, so upsetting to them. The guards just completely disregarded them, didn't understand anything about being deaf, didn't believe that they were deaf thought that they were sort of play acting or pretending and saying, come on, talk, I know you can talk when this person is deaf, right? They're communicating using sign language. And this avenue was just taken away from them. So it was very uh, much an impact on this person's life um, thereafter. They were very reluctant to interact with the guards after this interaction, even if it's just something normal, you know, meeting a guard on the street they really didn't like the guards after this interaction. 
So another example here, this is from a solicitor who had had a deft client and they talked about, so they were in court and then there was the other side in the court. And the other side, it was suggested by a party to the court. So the other side suggested that your client understands everything. So the deaf person understands everything. Your client is lip reading from across the room, all this sort of stuff. So again, the context here, this is a client who, or a, a solicitor who had a deaf client and the opposition was basically saying, your client is lying about being deaf so that the court will be sympathetic towards them so that they can get away with it so that they can be seen as this like you know uh oh, pitiful person and so that we know that they're not deaf or we know that they don't need interpretation um this solicitor in particular said something to me that stood out quite a bit they said that it was said about their client that their client didn't look deaf and I thought that was really interesting because what does looking deaf mean? Um, I don't know, but it was because this person was like, you know, just a, a regular person. They didn't have any sort of characteristic that would have made them seem different to this person in the court. And so it was suggested that they were lying about it, that they didn't need an interpreter, that somehow an interpreter was going to be um, a way for them to get away with whatever it was that they were being charged with. So let's move on then to the second thing, the, the pity for, for deaf people that also came out of this research. There was definitely much more of this pity than there was of the disbelief, the first thing, the not believing that a person was deaf, but um, nevertheless, it, it, it's still important. But um, yeah, this, this is the pity uh, for deaf people. So this person just spoke generally about guards and they said, Guardy think deaf people are stupid. They see through you. They don't see you as an individual. They'll speak to the hearing person with you. And I thought this was really interesting that this person's perception of guards in general was just that they weren't respected. They weren't seen as an individual. They weren't seen as their own person even when they were at the center of an issue. So I thought this was something that was really interesting that even when the deaf person was the, the, was the person causing the interaction. So we'll say, for example, it's a speeding issue and the deaf person is driving. This is just an example. This isn't what happened in this case, but I'm just giving an example. Um, so it's a deaf person driving and they're the one speeding and the hearing person is in the passenger seat and the guard who pulls them over starts talking to the hearing person. Hearing person's not driving, right? It's the deaf person who did the driving. And the deaf person felt really kind of disrespected. They felt like, like they said, that, that the guardy just saw through them, that they there was no respect for deaf people because you're just seen as stupid when you're interacting with guards. And that was really, really hurtful to them uh, and something that they it really affected them. And they felt what had a grave effect on the community overall, that deaf people are not respected um, and are not seen as individuals. Um, and kind of, I guess, sort of had to be minded by the hearing person that's with them, if there's a hearing person that's with them. Um, who knows what happens when there's, when there's no hearing person around. So another example. So this is a, another car issue, a traffic issue. So, um, the guard had turned around and he said, do you realize that your engine doesn't sound good? And I said, no, I'm deaf. I wear two hearing aids. And then they started to laugh. And so he said, the guard said, OK, OK, I, so I don't know if he felt sorry for me and didn't process the fine. I don't know. But I do know at the time, I do know I was wrong that they were evidently breaking the law. So again, for context here. This is a person who had a traffic issue and they knew that they had been in the wrong. They knew they were in the wrong. They were pulled over by a Garda and the Garda starts berating them and saying, well, you, you can't be doing this on the road and, and kind of shouting at them and then saying, oh, and your engine doesn't sound good as well. And that's when the deaf person said, well, I didn't hear it because I'm deaf. 
And immediately when that happened, their whole demeanor changed. The guard said, oh, sorry, okay, okay, okay. And didn't process the fine that they knew was coming. The deaf person was like, I'm definitely getting fined for that. And then when the, they realized that the, the guard was, when they realized that the, the deaf person was deaf, no fine came. So they assumed that it was because the guard had felt pity for them. Now, I was just talking to a deaf person about this during the week, and I don't know, maybe this is an instance of like deaf gain or like a benefit for deaf people. And I'm not trying to take that away from deaf people. You know, this person didn't get a fine and that's great. I'm sure they were delighted, but they were delighted with it. Um, and we're quite careful on the road thereafter, I, I believe. But um, there's something to be said for the reason why the Garda was like, oh, I, I don't want to process this fine because I pity you. So that was something that was interesting in itself to come out of the research that, yeah, it worked out good in this case, but what if it doesn't? What if it's like the first instance where this person said that Garda see you as stupid, they don't see you as an individual. So there can be good and bad from it. Um, have I another one now? Sorry. Yeah. So one more. So when the guard arrived and realized that I was deaf, there was no communication at all. He just gave me a pen and a piece of paper and said, write down your name and address and never ask me what happened. He spoke to all the other people on either end, but didn't speak to me at all. And for me that day, on that day, I was upset. And so this is another instance where the deaf person was at the center of this issue. They were at the very center of this issue and they could see that the guard was going to communicate with the hearing people who were around, but not them. They didn't get to have their say. They didn't get to, to tell what happened in the moment like the hearing people did. They had to arrange at a later point to go and speak to Gardaí and there was issues with that. Uh, I'll get into that. But this person didn't get an opportunity to be heard because the guard just sort of said, I don't know how to communicate with you. Here's pen and paper. Give me your name and address. I'll contact you later. And again, this is this is kind of more the same thing that the first person said, that you're not respected, you're not seen as an individual, you're not the hearing people are preferenced over you. And so while in the this the second person who got away with a fine, that worked out well for them, this person again, they were upset by this and they felt that they weren't valued in the same way that hearing people were. So I'm going to move on because I know I'm getting close to the half hour point now, just to some other issues that arose that I think are important. Um, I should say that I did all of this research before the ISL Act came into force. So the ISL Act came into force in December 2020. And so I interviewed everybody prior to the um, ISL Act coming into force. Um, so that wasn't affected, the ISL Act didn't affect anyone's experiences. Um, so it would be interesting to see how it's affected and how it's changed. But I think some of these issues still exist that aren't covered by the ISL Act. You know, Garda attitudes will say towards deaf people, that's not covered by the Act. Um, so it would be interesting to see, to see how things have changed or if things have changed on that level. So um, some of these issues that I'm going to talk about will have changed. So there were instances of untrained interpreters being used. But again, this was before the ISL Act. Um, and that was quite worrying for the people who had experienced that, that an interpreter who, you know, was getting basic signs wrong is interpreting for them in a legal context, which can be really scary. And these people are having to, like, correct the interpreter as they're trying to give their statement or, or give their witness testimony in court or whatever it is. Um, availability of interpreters was a big issue. And I, I mean, I suppose I don't need to explain that to anyone here tonight, um, particularly in rural guard stations late at night and the availability of deaf interpreters was a big issue. Um, there are not enough interpreters. There's not adequate pay for interpreters. Um, and when you have things like, very briefly, there's a time limit on how long Gardaí can hold you for, right? So if you're arrested, they can't keep you forever. They have to keep you for a certain amount of time. And if you're in, we'll say, I don't know, 
I'm from Leash, like rural Leash and it's the middle of the night and you can't find an interpreter, the clock is still ticking for the Gary So they're under pressure to interview you in the time that they have and they can't find an interpreter. So it's a big problem, not just for deaf people, but for guards as well. I and mean, then the whole legal system is, is at the behest of like not a lot of interpreters. And that's a big problem. Um, another issue is like access to an interpreter and who grants the access to interpreter. So, Gardaí and courts sometimes just didn't think a person needed an interpreter. As I said, there was that example where there was a, a deaf client who the solicitor said, oh, he doesn't look deaf, so he doesn't need an interpreter. And that's not for a guard or a solicitor or a court to decide. And yet sometimes they make that decision because maybe they saw a deaf person communicating in spoken English. But if you're in a court, it's very loud, you're back very far, you know, there's a lot of people talking at once, maybe you can't see very closely. So if you rely on like lip reading and a hearing aid, it can be very difficult actually in that environment to, to hear or to communicate or to understand. So maybe ISL is better. And sometimes that was denied to people. Um, confidentiality was an issue as well, which is worrying. <laughs> Um, and it relates to the availability of interpreters. So realistically, you should have your own interpreter for, say, your consultation with your solicitor if we're to talk about a guard station. So if I'm arrested for, I don't know, drink driving, and I go to the guard station and I have my solicitor, my solicitor comes along, and then my interpreter comes along and we have a private discussion. Then when I go into the guard interview room, the same interpreter comes with me and realistically it should be a different one but because we don't have enough interpreters we can't afford to have that and because of the late the time issues that are affected sometimes it's just not possible so it can be really difficult to as I said here adhere to best practices and so best practices very often are slipping you know best practices around swapping over interpreters around deaf interpreters that sort of thing, very often that falls by the wayside because um, of, of issues. Um, so that's just other issues around interpreters. There were some issues around physical problems, particularly of guard stations, but also in courts. So um, I don't know if you've, how many of you have ever been in the guard station interview room, but they're very, very small. It's a very tiny room it's crowded in there so it's a little room they have a table and chairs that are usually like secured to the ground and there will be usually two guardy and then a person sitting across to them who's being interviewed sometimes with a solicitor then they might have an interpreter right that's a fourth person in the room then they might have a deaf interpreter that's a fifth person in the room this is a really really small room and you've got five people kind of squashed into it and then because of the size of the room and because they're not set up with deaf people in mind the video recording that exists in Garda station interview rooms is not adequate so as I understand it there's one behind the guardies the guardie are sitting here the guard the camera is behind the guard so it looks at the person being interviewed then there's one in the ceiling so looking down on everybody that doesn't necessarily catch the interpreter and very often it doesn't. And if there's a deaf interpreter, it's definitely not catching everybody. So you're losing out on something that's very valuable because if you're relying later on and saying, hang on, I didn't say that. That's not what I said, that was bad interpretation. Well, we don't know because we didn't catch the interpreter. So we didn't see what was being said. So that can be really problematic. And the guard stations as they're built are just not built for deaf people. They're not built with that in mind. Similarly, recording happens in courtrooms so courtrooms are audio recorded and then there's a transcript printed off of the audio thereafter however there's only audio recording so there isn't to my knowledge any video recording in existence in in uh, courts since the pandemic there may have been a process for that I'm actually not sure what the data is on that but since the pandemic everything kind of switched kind of like Zoom, it's not Zoom, but the courts used a Zoom-like 
webinar feature. Um, so maybe there's recording now, and I don't know how many deaf people have been to court since then, but in the regular courts, there is not video recording set up. So again, you don't catch the interpreter and you don't catch the deaf person who's signing. And then finally, handcuffing of ISL, deaf ISL users, which I kind of mentioned previously about a person being detained with their hand behind their back. But um, we handcuffing is a, a part of the, the criminal justice system in Ireland. We allow for it, we allow for it to happen. Um, it's not, it doesn't always happen and there usually has to be some sort of justification for it. But a Garda can say that a person was was seemed violent because maybe they were signing very aggressively or very they were very aggravated and they were very loud in their ISL that may seem aggressive to a guard who then decides to handcuff and that can be incredibly demeaning for a deaf person and there is a lot of kind of like there's people looking into that research in America and such but it is something that we do do and there's nothing to say that guardy I guess can't do it to a deaf person. Um, or nothing to my knowledge that says they shouldn't. Uh, so yeah, so that's where I'm going to leave it this evening in terms of the presentation part of it. I'm going to check the time. Yeah, so we have about 20 minutes for Q&A now. I'm going to stop the recording, but I really appreciate everybody for listening. Thank you so much. And I will end my slides now and uh, we can start the Q&A. So thank you all. <laughs>